Hello and welcome to Tales and Trails. I'm Minnie Menon. It is frustrating and often confounding, but for many people across the world, even today, India is associated with snake charmers, uh, sadhu sitting on nails, doing the rope trick, etc., etc. But if you wondered why this image has stuck, you just have to read uh, the new book which is out by John Zubrisky on uh, the Jaduwala's jugglers and all the enchantment that goes with it. Uh, Joining me today is John, as well as my colleague Akshay Chavan. Thanks both of you for joining us. John, uh, you're a great teller of tales. I loved <laughs> all your books, and I must tell you, this one is fantastic. And when I was reading it, the one thing that stood out was, why hasn't anybody done this before? Look, um, yeah, that is a good question. I think, uh, I, you know, I am uh, an academic as well as a journalist, and academics have traditionally treated popular culture, such as magic, with quite a bit of derision. It's changing now and there's a lot more work being done on popular culture and its importance because it does pervade, you know, almost every aspect of, of society in one way or another. And um, so I think that's probably the reason why it hasn't really been looked at so far. Mm -hmm. You know, what I kind of took away from the book, and that's always been very interesting, is that there are two strains to this, right? Mm -hmm. The one is a Western perception of India. So mm. even if you look at the Greek accounts, you had mm. ants digging up uh, gold, gold from the ground. Yeah. And that's the kind of imagery that India always kind of uh, yeah. managed to conjure up, yeah. you know, in, yeah. in the West. The second is that magic was somewhat legitimate in mm. India. You've quoted uh, uh, Kautalya's uh, Arthashastra, mm. where he talks about magicians, yeah. you know. You've Being spoken used about, as spies, yes. yes. Absolutely. So how do these two strains develop? Well, you know, as I say, I mean, I call the book a magical history of India because I wanted to, firstly, uh, at the beginning of the book, establish why India, you know, was seen as being such a magical place. Um, so you do have, um, you know, the story of the gold digging ants that were probably um, uh, um, uh, marmots, uh, you know, who uh, did exist in uh, places like Kashmir that dug burrows into the ground and sometimes gold came out of the, the, those diggings. So that story, you know, passed on from person to person, traveller to traveller, you know, took on a different quality and suddenly, you know, you had these giant gold digging ants, um, you know, entering the popular imagination. Um, and that, you know, that you can see that going all the way through uh, tales of uh, um, recounted by Arab travellers, merchants and pilgrims and so on. Um, people like Ibn Battuta, Marco Polo. It continues right up until the 19th century when, you know, the, um, the British period and you start to sort of get a more balanced view of what is actually uh, <laughs> in India. Um, and then you've got, uh, you do have this other strain where, as you say, magic in India is something that has always been legitimate. I mean, in the West, um, witches were burned at the stake or anyone who was perceived to be dabbling in black magic was immediately ostracized or, or put to death. Uh, in India, magic has always coexisted with, you know, in, in all forms of magic. Yeah, and and it, and it has been legitimate. I mean, you do find references in you know in the Jataka tales, for instance, to snake charmers and conjurers and and so on being you know uh, in, in in the royal courts. So so how do you think the, the you know the interaction between the West and and India? I mean, do you think that, that India provided it a sa safe space, unlike the West, you know, where the you know the Sufi was put to death in Baghdad mm. or mm. you know the, the witch burnings in in Europe. Yeah, no, that, that's true. I mean, uh, you know, as you say, Cotillia urged the use of magicians as, as spies, and you find lots of references uh, uh, in, in the Arthur Shastra, for instance, to um, you know use of magic spells in in uh, in, in war, and, and the Arthur Veda as well. You find lots of um, is sometimes called a, a, you know the book of spells because it has so many magic spells. So yeah, it, it it always had this sort of legitimate space there. Um, for Westerners looking at India, um, I guess they, they took what they, you know, what, what, what particularly appealed to them, you know, what, what, uh, you know, at different times because when I mean, you did have in the late 19th century, uh, you know, the rise of spiritualism in the West and there, you know, um, people like Madame Blavatsky of the Theosophical Society, you know, who, who really looked to India as a source of inspiration as well for her teachings and beliefs and elevated Indian magic, um, magical practices way above those of the West, that there was a special quality about them, that, you know, the, that the magicians of India could do things that 
Western magicians had no clue about and it was real magic, it wasn't the sort of sleight of hand stuff that, that Westerns did. In your book, it is full of such interesting characters, you know, right from Linga Singh to, you know, Ramaswamy to, uh, you know, uh, Khuda Baksh and also, who, who's your favourite one? <laughs> Look, I, I do like the story of Linga Singh, Amanatha Dutt, because you know here you have this you know hapless teenager being recruited uh, by a prince, uh, um, uh, by this man posing as a, as a prince from Baluchistan, who was actually a curry cook going to Manhattan. Uh, fabulously wealthy because, you know, he managed to rent out 24 rooms in St. Ermin's Hotel in London and pay his bill in gold bullion. Um, but he, you know, these, the, the people he recruited, there was about two dozen of them, uh, once they got to America where he was, uh, uh, where he'd promised them jobs in his uh, uh, Manhattan curry eatery, they were basically left to fend for themselves. Um, most of them took the opportunity to go back to India, Amanath Dat, um, as Linga Singh was called, you know, that was his real name, um, um, you know, found, you know, work as a, as a kitchen hand and must have, you know, dabbled in sleight of hand um, before then because, you know, he, he, he you know, he, there are just wonderful descriptions of him sitting on the steps of his brownstone in Queens, uh, throwing objects in the air that never came down, um, disappearing in clouds of cigarette smoke. You can find this uh, written up in, in, in uh, local newspapers at the time. So he was quite a character. Eventually, and we're not exactly sure why, but he joined Madame Karma's revolutionary cell in Paris, bent on the overthrow of the British Raj, mm -hmm. and was sent to America as a bomb maker. Uh, so, so re really quite extraordinary, um, you know, you could, stop, you could stop there and it would already be a fantastic story, <laughs> but it just keeps on getting better. And, and, and you have many of these characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, uh, John, there was an element of exploitation and you wrote, oh, yeah, wrote totally. about mm. that uh, mm. on LHI. The other aspect which I found very interesting was how Lucknow, mm. uh, Calcutta mm. and uh, Madras became mm. the centres yeah. for a lot of these uh, magicians who then went out. Mm. Yeah. How did it kind of get funneled into these small groupings? Yeah, look, I mean, they were, of course, spread all over India, but um, um, the, the, the jugglers or magicians from South India were supposed to be among India's best. Um, and that might have something to do with the suppleness of their bodies, that South Indian uh, physique being, you know, uh, slighter and so on. Um, Bengal, because it was, Eastern India has always been associated with magic, black magic and, and white magic. Um, and then Lucknow, I think because of the, you know, the, you know, the, the you know, the, the kingdom of Oud, um, because they, again, uh, many of these magicians were employed in these um, princely courts, or the courts of the Nawabs, and, and, and Oud is one example of that. Um, and then also, Calcutta and Madras particularly were sources of recruitment um, by Westerners wanting to take these magicians to the West because they were ports, they were areas, that there were cities where there was a large concentration of Europeans. So, you know, these, these street magicians would come and perform for these Europeans. And, uh, and you know, I, I talk, uh, I describe the story of, uh, of this first troop of Indian jugglers who was taken, that was taken to the West in 1813. What is interesting is that there was a lot of money to be made. In there was a huge amount of money you, to you, be made. You chanced upon um, a, a, a correspondence which indicated that Motilal Nehru yes. actually took a troop for the uh, Paris exhibition. I mean, you would never associate the two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd never associate the two. And it was, it was, I was lucky. Look, I, I was looking at any files to do with the emigration of Indian labourers uh, from India to, you know, countries uh, in, in, I mean, there were a lot were sent as indentured labourers, of course, to places like Mauritius and Fiji and, and, uh, and East Africa. Um, but, but there were also a lot that, a lot of these um, spectacular performers, as they were termed. So you had magicians, you had musicians, you had nauch dancers, you had acrobats and so on. Um, who were recruited en masse for these world fairs. And that started in the you know, 1870s, 1880s. And there were numerous instances of these people being recruited uh, by these quite unscrupulous uh, impresarios um, uh, and being made, because they were illiterate, they would be made to sign contracts that they didn't understand. They were promised passage to, to England or, or Europe and told that they would uh, be getting so much money uh, per month and then 
then you know, they'd have a passage home. More often than not, they were just dumped on the streets of places like Berlin, Brussels, London, and so on, and it was left up to the India office to repatriate them at great cost. Um, so when, so, so I was, when I was looking uh, at this, I, I stumbled across this file which mentioned that Motilal Nehru was one of these people doing the recruiting. In the 20th century, something really interesting happens where on one hand, you know, where in, in the West and the Theosophy movement, you know, mm. there is this whole thing about Indian magic being mm. reinforcing the stereotype of exotic, spiritual mm. India. Yep. And at the same time in India, you know, there are this, this new generation of Indians for whom magic is being modern, Western ma mm. magic is being modern and progressive mm. and this is happening at the same time. So how, mm. how do you see that? Yeah, no, it's fascinating, yeah. Now, as, as you say, you know, with the rise of um, movements like the Theosophical Society, India really took on an extra added mystical quality. Um, but at the same time, you had this, you know, the rise of this new class of educated, uh, English educated elite uh, who might uh, go to a performance by a Western magician who was touring India, and there were a lot of them. They were, they were all over the place, because um, some of them would spend months in India, and because you, in, in all these cantonment towns, you had theatres that were set up. Um, and so they would go from town to town to town, um, you know, by train with, you know, tons of equipment and assistance and so on. It was, it was quite a complicated undertaking. And, uh, and so there was a lot of opportunity to, you know, to witness their shows. And, uh, and again, very profitable for them because you had this captive audience. I mean, people were starved for entertainment and they'd love to go and see magic. And they would perform not just for you know, the, the, the English expatriate population, but also for the locals as well. And, and so, but, so you had more and more Indians were exposed to Western style magic. And some of them, of course, found it fascinating and wanted to learn some of the tricks. And you could, ex you, you could buy um, uh, instructional books in bookstores, probably on railway station platforms. You know, there's evidence that there was you know, cheap, you know, these chap books, they call them, um, that you could buy for a couple of annas, um, uh, which might just, which would have a few tricks uh, that you could learn there. And you know they, it, it, you know, it's it, what is really interesting too is that the first magic societies mm. were formed in India a quarter of a century before they were formed in the West. Wow. So one of the interesting things, well, what got me interested in this whole thing, was that at the same time as these Western-style Indian magicians were travelling to the West, dressed in their top hats and tails because they were doing Western-style parlour magic. Uh, they were encountering all these Westerners who were dressed up as Indians because, you know, <laughs> Indian magic and Indian tropes were, you know, flavour of the month at the time. So in in course of your uh, research, what is, what is the most unbelievable thing, you know, which, which you've come across? <laughs> you say, I can, this, I know I'm studying magic, but I still can't believe this. Look, there, there were so many unbelievable things. I mean, I do describe, you know, I mean, look, I, I, I don't make a ju any judgments in, in, in my book. I don't. I just present things as they were seen, as they were described, you know, by the people who, who saw them at the time. But you know, there's there's a wonderful description of uh, an unpublished manuscript in the British Library that described a, you know, a, a wizard in Kashmir who could atomize and deatomize objects hundreds of miles apart. You know, so you would have an object here that would suddenly disappear and reappear, you know, but way How would the... they have checked it out? I mean, this is before <laughs> the internet. <laughs> well, as I'm saying, you know, these are, you asked what these remarkable stories were, and that's what it was. And I've been working with some of these magicians uh, uh, for, for, you know, we've done several shows together, and uh, uh, they're not going to tell me the secrets to their tricks. And, and, I've, I've, and, I've, and I've, I've watched them, and I, you know, and I still cannot get how they do it. So I'm going to ask you that question. Mm. Do you think it's sleight of hand? Do you think there is something? I think it's all sleight of hand. I'm, it I'm, is all yeah, sleight of hand. It's all sleight of hand. I, I, don't ask me, I can't explain it, but it's all sleight of hand. So you, you don't think that there's something metaphysical and, you know? No, unfortunately. No, no. 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 Now, John, last question. You know, you've done some fabulous works, right? I mean, the last Nizam was fantastic. I, mean, I remember reading it and being very jealous of you, saying that here's a journalist who's gone out and done this fabulous story. What a tale it was. And then the mysterious Mr. Jacob, another great tale. And now the Jadu Wala. So what made you choose these areas to work on? Look, you know, the, the Nizam book was a kind of story waiting to be told and it had this fantastic India-Australia connection because Mukram Jha of course went to Australia and, and had this huge you know half million acre um, you know 
basically sheep station in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I was just fascinated by the fact why an Indian prince would want to go there in the first place. And of course, you know, the tragic story of what happened to him and, and, and that, uh, that vast fortune that he inherited. Um, the Mysterious Mr. Jacob was another book which, you know, because he was a, Alexander Malcolm Jacob was a character, you know, he was a celebrity in his days. I mean, you, I mean people would say, you know, going to Simla without seeing Jacob was like going to India without seeing the Taj Mahal. He was of that sort of stature. Yet there was, um, and he was, you know, a household name in, in the late 19th, early 20th century, yet no one knew where he came from or really what happened to him. And, uh, and why he became the sort of figure that he was. So that fascinated me. Um, anything that requires a bit of digging and detective work always fascinates me. And then, you know, the, you know Jacob was a diamond merchant and, uh, and a spy, and he also dabbled in magic, which sort of got me interested in, so kind of in a, magic. So some kind of a yeah, backward there, integration. There, there is, there is, yeah, 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 yeah. Because, of course, the Jacob... Jacob was linked to the Nizam, Nizam and, you know, yes. and magic was linked to Jacob. Magic was linked to Jacob, yeah. Fabulous. Fabulous. Thank you so much, John, <laughs> for being pleasure. here and joining us. And we hope to see lots more stories no, from you be. on the history. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. No problem. Thanks. Thank you.